Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. I want to say thank you to Pastor Jason for allowing me this opportunity. I, I always uh, look forward to coming here, seeing your smiling faces. You know, I've been, so each month I've been traveling around basically and kind of on my book tour on the sacred truths. 12 foundational truths that we all need to know to have peace, joy in our life. But I'm missing the teaching. I love to teach the Word of God. And this is one of those topics, redemption, that needs to be taught. Um, I, unfortunately, I won't teach it this morning because I'm going to kind of stay on task because if I don't, then we might be here for a couple of hours. But before I can get into the, the message, redemption. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 20, it says, you are bought by his blood. You're not your own. The word bought is another uh, form of redemption. You have been redeemed. Financial term of redemption is you, you redeem a coupon or you redeem a bond, and it comes back with interest. So there is this idea that the Lord, because of his love, and Revelation talks about it, Book of Acts talks about it, because of his love for us, he purchased, he redeemed us. But what was the price? This is what we sometimes overlook. It cost not us anything. It cost the Father, His Son. So we have been, we are redeemed people. I was thinking about this. We are the only religion, the only religion on the entire planet that has redemption at the foundation of our faith. God bought, purchased, redeemed man back to himself through his son. We're the only religion that teaches that. The only one. That's fascinating. That just shows you the power of the gospel and the truth of God, uh, our Father's love for us. And which brings us to the title. God's love redeemed you. And our, and our theme verse, our key verse here is Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. In him we have redemption purchased through his blood and this brings the forgiveness of sins and, and in accordance to what? What brings that? Well, why was that brought forth? In accordance with the riches of God's abundant grace. We were redeemed. We were purchased through God's grace by the blood of the Son Jesus Christ. Let's go to prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to bring forth the word. I thank you for this church. I thank you for Pastor Jason. I Jason, I thank you for the congregation, Lord. I thank you for light. Thank you for light. I thank you for a beautiful weekend. I thank you that we allow, we were allowed to enjoy this weekend, Father, through camping and through cookouts and just traveling to Elkins and seeing friends, Father. You are a gracious God. But we know around the world there are atrocities that are happening, Lord. And people feel lost. This world feels lost. So help us, Lord, to be these messengers a messenger of redemption, of love, of purchase. You bought us back. You, you, you loved us to the point where you will allow your own son to die for us, Father. We thank you for the redemption story. For it is a beautiful story. And we're the only ones that we have it. We are the only ones that have it. So help us to be bold enough to be able to share this truth. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Redemption stands as one of the most overwhelming and transformative concepts within the Christian faith, in all of faiths. It embodies the promise of renewal, forgiveness, and salvation. At the heart of this remarkable journey of redemption lies the enduring and boundless love of God. That's the heart of redemption, is the enduring and boundless love of God. Through divine intervention, and that speaks to God becoming man. This is a divine act, this redemption, redemption story. Through divine intervention, humanity is offered a chance at redemption, a chance to be reclaimed, restored, and delivered from this world of death, decay, and sin by the unyielding power of God's love. That's the opening to this chapter, to God's redemptive love for humanity. Exodus 15, 13 states this, in your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. That's what we look forward to, to be back 
be guided to our holy dwelling. There's a day he's coming back. We all know this. We've been preaching, we've been preaching this for thousands of years. The Lord is going to return. No one knows the day or the hour, but boy, it looks like it might be close. How many of us want it to be close? I know me. I know the older you get, you live your life and you experience and, and, and enjoy it a lot, but you're ready for that next phase, that next stage. You're ready to be with Christ for all of eternity. This is a beautiful truth. And I know, let me speak for myself. I look forward to that day. I cannot wait for that day. So redemption is the basis, it's the foundation of our Christian faith. In the intricate nuances of life, every individual will face moments of brokenness, whether through personal failures or the harshness of a world marred by sin. In these moments of despair and regret, it is easy to feel lost and unworthy and beyond redemption. How many of us have been there? How many of, how many of us, or how many of us know someone who feel like they're beyond redemption? Their life is just over. There's nothing that can be done. My God, my God. Because this is the hope. We are the hope. I am going to preach a little bit. We are the hope. The, the Christian, the body of Christ, we are the hope. This is why our ministry goes to, we have a, an addiction ministry on Thursday night. Why my wife and I used to do a lot of volunteer work at the homeless shelter uh, mission down in Clarksburg and, and interact with a lot of individuals in our lives that have drug addiction or alcoholic addiction or some kind of addiction that has destroyed their life. They sit there in their misery and they all believe, they all say this out of every one of their mouths, I have no future. I have no hope. Do you imagine the, the amount of despair that comes with that? When you use hope, when you lose hope, in fact, I think uh, not next month, but the month after, yeah, so in June, one of the chapters is uh, God's love is, is our hope. It is our hope. Without it, in fact, I'll do, I won't go there because there's a, I have a teaching on, on the Lord at the very end that, that it's, um, who does that? I can't remember now. I'll have to, we have to wait until June. <laughs> my, my prayer is just going to engage this morning. So it is easy to feel lost, unworthy, and beyond redemption. However, it is precisely in these depths of brokenness that God's reckless love emanates a pathway to redemption, no matter how far one has strayed. Listen to one of the most revealing stories in all of the Bible that helps convey this extraordinary truth. Most of you will know this story as soon as I start reading it. I'm going to paraphrase it. I'm not going to read it uh, verse by verse. But in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus explains, a wayward, uh, explains how a wayward son who demanded his inheritance before he was ready to receive it takes all that the father gave him and spent it on frivolous living and became destitute. This happens to a lot of us. Destitute to the point where he was living as a hired servant, being forced to eat the very food of the pigs he was caring for. The son comes to the realization that in his father's house, even servants live better than him. So he humbles himself and makes his way back home, expecting the worst. You have to understand this truth. When, when we talk about the prodigal son, which you all already, already figured out, that's what the story is about. The father is not going to crush you when you return to him. I want you to hear what the father did in this story. Jesus Christ is revealing to us the, the heart of his father, the heart of God to those who return to him. He looked in the story, the father is gazing, waiting, looking for the son, and he sees him come up over the horizon. Our father is waiting for everybody, even the worst, even the drug addicts, the prostitutes. He's waiting for them to acknowledge to themselves that their life is destitute. And without him, there's no hope. And then that should motivate them to say, Father, I want to come home. The son comes to the realization that in his father's house, servants live better than him, so he humbles himself and makes his way back home, expecting the worst. But on his return, he was shocked to see his father fully embrace him without a whisper about where he had been or what he had done. Remember the story? The father never brings up the kid's past. Never asked what he did with it. He embraced him because he's looking, because the father knows the future. We all, all of us, we're 
guilty. We, we're trapped in our past. I don't know what it is. It's, it's, I think our past is like an addiction. We always look back. I know. I'm a what if, right? I, I, you cannot kill a soul quicker than by living by the what if. What if I would have done this? What if I would have said that? What if I would have made this investment? What if I would have married this person? And if you live like that, you will always live in depression. This story is about the future, who you are in Christ Jesus, who the Father is, and what he's waiting for us to do. Return. He's begging for us to return to him. All of the whole world, even the, even the ones we, let's be honest, don't think deserve it, maybe. Maybe they shouldn't walk through those doors. The ones we don't want to talk to. Do you know the Father's waiting for them to? Everyone. That's the heart of our father. But on his return, he was shocked to see his father fully embrace him without a whisper about where he had been or what he had done. Instead, he welcomed him home, not as a disgraced servant. Oh, I, can't, I love this part. Not as a disgraced servant, but as a son. He's, well, he's waiting for you to welcome you home, not to reveal your past, not as a disgraced servant. He's not going to bring back any of those. Remember, his, your sin has been removed as far as east from the west. He's forgotten. They're over with in Christ Jesus. He's waiting to embrace you and do this. <clears throat> um, not as a disgraced servant, but as a son, and lavished him with great gifts. This is what the father did to the prodigal son. He lavished him with great gifts, and the story goes on from a big party. The oldest son gets ticked off about that. Sometimes we're the oldest son. Just saying. He walked him home, lavished him with great gifts. This story that Jesus tells about the prodigal son beckons all of us to consider returning home to our Father and allowing Him to sweep away all of our sins so we can claim the rightful inheritance. Not that, not that fake inheritance that we thought was ours so we can go spend it frivolously on the world. The true inheritance, which is Jesus Christ. He's our inheritance, and we're His. The rightful inheritance of redemption found in Jesus Christ. Isaiah 44, 22. I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. And here it is. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. You have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, it's like, almost like preaching to the choir when I do, when I do messages like this. because I'm, I'm assuming, I'm pretty sure it's safe bet that you're all saved. You all believe in Jesus Christ and most of you, you would be here. But even in our daily lives, how many times I, I'm on a new journey in my life with my Lord. Let me just share this with, real, with you real quick. For some reason, mentally, and I think maybe we're all guilty of this, we have God pictured in our mind as some God that's distant, high in the sky, way up there, right? He's unapproachable. And, that, and a lot of that teaching comes from the Old Testament. God came to visit us. God came to live with us. He did live with us. His name is Jesus Christ. And guess where he's at now, if you're a believer? He's not in the heavens. He's inside you. He literally deposits his spirit. His spirit lives in you. God lives in us. So I've been on this new journey, not talking to God as some distant God. Oh, Father in the heavens, help me. I speak to the Father that's in me. Lord, you're with me today. That brings me great joy. Because I know you're not going to forsake me or leave me. Ephesians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 talks about this. He seals the spirit in us as a guarantee for the promise of our inheritance. He's not going to forsake himself. Yes, you'll mess up sometimes. But the father doesn't leave his children. The father does what? The children when they mess up. Corrects them. Loves them. So I now look at God. I, I speak to God in, in a manner where I speak to him inside. And I wake up in the morning and say, I, I, this is just me. Just me. I'm like, oh, Jesus, you're still with me. Good morning. How you doing? That's just my visual way to It just helps me in the morning. I know you're still with me. Now, sometimes I question, well, how? He's still with me because if it was me, I'd be like, nope, dude, I'm out. But he's still, he's still with me because he loves me. Amen. Central to this concept of redemption is the liberating power of forgiveness. Oh my gosh, this is the beautiful part of our redemption. God's love infused with boundless grace and mercy 
offers the gift of forgiveness to all who seek it. True forgiveness changes the guilt and shame are shattered and the soul is set free. And it's through the lens of God's love that individuals come to understand that no sin is too great, no mistake too monumental to preclude the possibility of God redeeming his creation. No sin is too great. No sin. Because if there's one single sin, well, there is one sin, it's the rejection of Jesus Christ. But if there is any other sin outside of that that cannot be redeemed, which one is it? Which one is it? And God help me if I commit it, because I'm beyond redemption. Nowhere in Scripture is that taught. Outside of Jesus Christ, you are not saved. But inside of Jesus Christ, every sin has been paid for, bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. That gives all of us hope. That gives the worst of the alcoholic, the drug addict, the prostitute, whatever other faith you're in, it gives us hope that whatever I did. This, how do we know this to be true real quick? Let's just look at the characters of our Bible. Moses murdered somebody. He was a murderer. How about the Apostle Paul? Ah, man, he murdered people, persecuted, and he did it in the name of God to the church. How about King David? He had an affair, murdered somebody, and all of these people, if you go to Hebrews chapter 11, have been redeemed. There's not a sin that separates you from God except unbelief. Every sin has been paid for and can be paid for and bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. Every single sin. That gives all of us hope. This whole planet hope. Listen to Romans 5, 20, 21. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. That's the purpose of the law. To show us how sinful we are. But as people sin more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So, just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It's, and in the New King James says, where grace abound, or where sin abound, grace abound more. But that word abounded in the original Greek, you know what it actually means? It's super abounded. So, sin abounded, just uh, not super abounded, just abounded, but the prefix to the abounded in the Greek or grace, super abounded. That means grace trumps sin every single time because of the redemptive work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the cross. The magnitude of God's love for humanity is exemplified in the Christ paid for redemption, the sacrificial offering of Jesus Christ, God's own Son. This divine exchange where sins are forgiven and poured out on the soul, son and so this divine exchange where sins are forgiven and poured out on the son and souls are redeemed. Okay. Let me read this slower. This divine exchange where sins are forgiven and poured out on the son and souls are redeemed, made righteous, stands as a testament to the immeasurable depth of God, depth of God's love. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21 is one of my all-time favorite verses. Listen to this. I've preached on this a thousand different ways. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. He who knew no sin, that means the spotless one, the perfect one, never sinned. He became sin for you and I, the ones who did sin. Now listen to what was the result of this. That we, you and I, might become the very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. What did you or I deserve? What did we do to deserve God's righteousness imparted to us? What, what was it? I can't think of one single thing except believe in Jesus Christ. He who knew no sin. Some translation becomes a sin offering. I, I do a teaching on the sin offering. The offering of the, uh, the sacrificial lamb. Both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, they're still the same. In the Old Testament, you have to go to the high priest and bring that sin offering for the forgiveness of your sins. The high priest, is, you know what the high priest does to the person who brings the sin offering? Nothing. He doesn't even look at the person. He doesn't even care less about this guy. He takes the sin offering and inspects thoroughly the sin offering. If the sin offering is perfect and spotless and blameless, you lay, the person who brought the sin offering lays his hands on there, confesses the sins, and then guess what? Walks away scot-free. Who gets slaughtered? 
The sin offering. That is the exact same thing that God did for us. He offers us his son, the spotless one, the perfect one, the blameless one. He inspects him. We confess our sins in Jesus Christ. We walk scot free, never to be looked at. A sin offering gets approached. We become the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. That's the redemptive story in a nutshell. That's why this is one of my favorite verses. Redemption is not a mere pardon. It is a journey of restoration where, where broken lives are meticulously repaired, made new, and transformed into vessels of grace. It is a process wherein the scars of the past are healed and individuals are empowered to embrace a new identity. And, and an identity rooted in God's love, forgiveness, and purpose. This journey requires vulnerability, humility, and an unwavering trust in God's redemptive work. Listen to this verse. Let your roots grow down into Him. And let your lives be built on Him. That your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught. And you will overflow with thankfulness. Our redemption is about one person. It's not about you. It's not about your behavior. It's about Jesus Christ. We're, our roots, our faith is to grow in Jesus. I, if I... If I had time, I would like to do an entire teaching on what that means for you and I. It comes from Galatians chapter 2, verse 21. It is no longer I who live, for I have died. But I now live how? By the faith, what? In Jesus Christ. And, and it specifically says, who is in me. Where is your faith placed? By the Son of God that now lives in you. So what does that mean for you and I? Literally, our faith is a gift from God itself. Now, when you and I, the, the embodiment of Christ, when somebody offends you, when somebody does something to you, we typically get angry. You know what that verse tells me? I should, that's why I'm on this new journey. You know what this verse tells me to do? In Galatians chapter 2, it says, wait. You're the feet of Jesus. Walk up to that person. You're now the mouthpiece of Jesus. Jesus is living in me. He's the one who wants to go to that offensive person. I don't want to go. I want, I want to choke that person. But Christ in me wants to go to him and do what? And wrap his arms around him and say, you're forgiven. You may go. What if we truly would live like that? What if we would allow Christ in us who wants to go and love and hug on that person and we say, okay, Christ, I don't want to, but I want to go because you're mine. Jesus said he loves you. Because it's him and me that's doing it. If we would allow ourselves to be instruments and, and, and vessels of grace, how many more people would come to Christ instead of you and I, what word is, let me speak by myself, instead of allowing Jesus to emanate, because that's where he lives from, in, me, in me, I let my flesh do the talking. So instead of I'll get this person, I'll punch him. How does that work? How do they see Christ? They don't. We are the vessels. Understanding the depths of God's redeeming love which shapes the core identity of individuals, just like I spoke of. They transition from being defined by their mistakes to being identified as redeemed children of God. This new identity empowers them to walk with confidence, knowing that they are loved, valued, and chosen by the creator of the universe. It instills a sense of purpose, compelling them to live a life that reflects the supernatural power of God's loving grace. Romans 12, 9 and 10. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly and affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. That's Christ in us, loving through us the ones that we have that offended us. That's Christ in us, loving through us to the one who offended us. How many, how, you know, I'm going to say, how different would the world be? I'm going to take that back. How different would the church be <laughs> if we acted like that with each other? I don't understand why we're brothers and sisters, but we'll hold brothers against a brother or sister in the church longer and than we will with somebody that's in the world. God help us. 
In the legacy of redemption, every thread is woven with the love of God, a love that redeems, forgives, and restores. Through, this, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the boundless grace of God, humanity is offered the chance to experience a radical transformation. As broken lives are mended and shattered souls are made whole, the resounding truth emerges. God's love redeems you. This is, the, and that, once again, the key verse, Ephesians 1.7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the, his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. All life on earth is measured and judged through the riches of God's grace. Let me say that again. All life on earth is measured and judged through the riches of God's grace. Not his judgment, through his grace and mercy, the cross. This profound reality beckons individuals to embrace the redeemed identity fully, leaving behind the shackles of the past and stepping into a future bathed in the radiant light of God's mercy and forgiveness. In this journey of redemption, Hearts are healed, spirits are revived, and lives are forever changed. All because of the enduring and unconditional love of God, a love that redeems even the most broken, offering a new beginning and a hope-filled future. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 through 22, another one of my favorite verses. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were sinners, you were enemies, separated from Him by your evil thoughts and actions. And now, he has reconciled, redeemed you to himself through, how did he do it? The death of Jesus Christ in his physical body. As a result, as a result of this redemption, listen to how, now in the original Greek, this is you know, it's what we call a present tense verse. So I want you to, when I read this, I want you to put in your mind, start thinking, this is how God views you today, right now. Even if you did something stupid last night, because you're in Christ Jesus, this is how God views you. That's what the first uh, verse 21 sets up. Now it sets up verse 22, and here it is. <clears throat> As a result, he has brought you into present tense, his own presence, and you are now holy, blameless, as you stand before him without a single fault. You might be saying to yourself, that's not possible. I'm not perfect. In the eyes of the Father, in Christ Jesus, you are as perfect as you're ever going to be. This rotten corpse still loves its sin and craves it, but God has paid the, the penalty for that. And this rotten corpse will eventually die and go to the grave. But you will live forever with Christ. And it is, it is that, that image, that picture, that person that God sees. You in the heavens with him. Ephesians 2 says, you are now seen. Present tense once again. Seated in the heavens with him. I don't know how that works, because I'm here today. But it says I'm seated in the heaven with him. This is the power of redemption for humanity if we would embrace it and accept it. Final paragraph. <clears throat> Through the finished redemptive work on the cross, the unimaginable has been accomplished. You and I now stand in the presence of God blameless, holy, without a single fault. Thank you, Lord. The chains of guilt and shame have been broken. You stand redeemed. Embracing this truth enables us to forgive ourselves and others, fostering emotional healing and spiritual renewal. It empowers us to move forward with a clean slate, free from the shackles of our past, and to rebuild our lives with confidence and purpose. Understanding that forgiveness is available through God's grace liberates us from the burden of past mistakes and teaches us to live holy in our lives here and now. And the final verse, Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. And listen to what it does. Listen to what the grace of God that has appeared. By the way, when it says grace, the grace of God has appeared. What's he talking about? It's a physical person. Who's the grace of God? John chapter 1. Jesus Christ. Christ came full of grace and mercy. Grace and truth is Jesus Christ. You cannot separate grace, you cannot separate, Je separate Jesus. They are one and the same. How do we know? For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us, Christ teaches us, to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age today. That is what grace does for us. God's grace teaches us holiness. It teaches us how to walk upright lives. 
It does not give you a license to sin. A lot of people talk about that. People talk about being redeemed by the, the grace of God. It does not give you a license to sin. It gives you a license to sing. Sing about his redemptive work and his mercy in your life. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this time here this morning, Lord. I pray that this message helps somebody, uh, motivates somebody, Lord, to to share the gospel, to share this truth about your radical love, the redemptive work of your, the finished redemptive work of your son on the cross. Lord, all sins are, co are covered under that one single act. There's no sin too great to be forgiven by you, Father. So help us to be emboldened by this truth so we can embrace that person that offends us next time, knowing that it's you that's in us that wants to speak to that person, Lord. In fact, let's be like Paul when he says, I now shall boast about my infirmities and my, and my, and my uh, persecution because then I am weak, but yet Christ in me is strong. Father, may that be true today for each and every one of us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you, guys, once again. Thank you, Pastor Jason, for allowing me to uh, take up your pulpit there for a few moments. Oh, that was right out of my head.
and I should be looking towards the kingdom of God. Your own body is a temple for God's spirit. No longer do we have to be in a temple. So remember that this week. And you all have a blessed week, a blessed Sunday. Amen.